All right, good afternoon. I'm having the strangest internet issues and computer issues the past few days. It's really weird. I don't know what's going on. The Zoom like kicked me out earlier today and I did an Amazon order this morning and it like didn't go through somehow. And I thought maybe that was just me, so I did it again and it didn't go through again. And I did it a third time and it went through and I don't know if I'm going to get three orders now or what. It finally sent me a confirmation message. Someone said Skype wouldn't close for me earlier. Yeah, it's it's weird stuff. Just kind of random things. But yeah, it's probably from the wind. I think it like blew the bits out of place or something. Did I get any cool stuff? Of course, you always get cool stuff, right? Um, yeah, I got a whole bunch of um, integrated circuits. So, you know, engineering... 250 stuff, um, got some tri-state buffers and uh, shift registers mostly. Uh, if you have Comcast, they're just reminding you who the boss is. Yeah, I have Comcast. Um, Taco Bell app issues, uh, branches down in the yard. Charge three times for one order. That's not good. Solder video, yay. Um, Alright, cool. Good stuff. Um, and now it's like sunny outside and beautiful, so I might try to get outside after class. I don't know. Anyway, um, hope everyone's doing well. Um, I... Graded your homework, and I'm going to make some general comments about the homework, but any questions uh, up front before we start on that? And I will not be giving you new homework today. I will post the homework on Friday, and it'll be due um, sometime next week, because Monday's a holiday. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Say again? I have a question. I'm just trying to pull up my homework here. Okay. Math 215 homework, yeah. Can I didn't see it until yesterday. It was supposed to be Monday. Okay. So, that's right. All right, well, let me start going through the homework and making some comments, and then if, if uh, specific questions come up, we can talk about those, too. Um, so let's let's do a quick run through on this. Um, so first of all, as I mentioned in the beginning of the course um, and in the extra notes, um, I I typically or sometimes will grade one problem from homework, right? And I won't tell you which one ahead of time, so you're compelled to do all of the homework equally well. Um, but on on questions where or homeworks where you know the questions are pretty short, I'll tend to look at more of them. So I looked at at a number of questions on this um, homework and some of them I didn't look at so if you're not sure um, that you did something correctly you should definitely ask about it because um, not losing points doesn't mean you did it correctly it might mean I didn't grade that question um, but um, so from the text um, section 1.1 so, so thank you for the effort on, on doing the homework well and making it presentable and so on. So it was very easy to, um, to read people's homeworks. They were all nicely organized and so on. So that's, that's awesome. Great work with that. Um, so specific questions, 1.1. Um, so I graded question two. So um, asked to list the elements of the following sets. So this first set... The set of all 1 over n, where n is 3, 4, 5, or 6. So that's a set containing a third, a fourth, a fifth, and a sixth. 
not not a lot of issue with that. The set of alpha and the alphabet such that alpha precedes f, so that's the set containing the elements a, b, c, d, e. All right, the third one gave people some pause. So the set of negative k such that k is in the set of positives. So one way to build up sets from this, this set building notation is look at the conditions. You're asked that k is some element of p, and for any value of k that satisfies that condition, we're told negative k is an element of the set. So for example, 1 is a positive number, so negative 1 is in our set. 2 is a positive number, so negative 2 is in our set. So this is actually the set of all uh, negative integers. I'm wondering if I maybe was the source of that, because I have blocks in class 2p, and I thought it was there as an empty set, or it had no elements, and we had talked about it, and we said, just saying that there are no elements, and so I think it was, I had posted it weird and said something weird, and I think the whole class maybe, or most of the class maybe just heard that. That, that could be. Before or whatever. Um, yeah, that can happen. Um, I had an engineering 250 class one, one quarter, and, um, and everybody was like, I think it was a JK flip-flop, everybody had the wrong behavior when J was 1 and K was 0. And I'm like, did people cheat on this or what? And, um, and then I remember that like somebody had come up with a really beautiful page of notes and had offered to share it with the class. And it was really nicely organized, but it had a, a typo in the JK flip-flop behavior and everybody, you know, used that typo in answering these questions. <laughs> so that happens. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> um... Yeah, so so um, so set builder notation. You can you can look at the condition on the right, and then um, do whatever is on the left to to find the elements in the set. So n has to be a factor of twenty four. So that's one, two, three, four, six, eight, twelve, and twenty four plus the negatives of those, right? And then and so that's what our collection of n's are, and then the set is the set of n's that are in p. So that gets you the positive factors. Um, I don't I don't mind if you use colon or a vertical bar. I'm happy with either. Um, okay. well, well, why the um, for for QE? Why the negative factors? If it's just n, it's n and um, it's all positive. So, so what I was saying was that if you look at this condition on n, n is a factor of 24, that's the positives and the negatives, right? And then you look over here and you say, what is my at set actually comprised of? It's comprised of all those n that are in the set of positives. So the set here would be just the positive factors, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, 12, and 24. All right, so up here, this is the set of all negatives. Um, and then for set D, the set consists of the elements 0, 1, and 4, right? Um, and if you write it out in set notation, you definitely don't want to list the 1 and 4 twice, because sets can never have duplicates in them. But if someone asks you, you know, what are the elements in this set, um, you would say 0, 1, and 4. If someone asks you what's your favorite food, you'd say, um, you know, cheeseburgers and pizza, you wouldn't say cheeseburgers, pizza, cheeseburgers, cheeseburgers, and pizza, right? I mean, you might. <laughs> um, so if, if you're listing the elements, right, there's no reason to list an element more than once, and that kind of leads to this notion that when you have a set, which is really just a list of the elements, you know, belonging to some collection, we don't list things more than once. And I didn't necessarily take off points for all these things. These are just things that, that I saw and that I wanted to, to kind of drill down into a little. All right, question four, we're going in the opposite direction. We're given a set and asked to use set builder notation to describe this. So, you know, lots of ways you can do um, each of these. So this might be the set of all integers, x such that x is bigger than or equal to one or less than or equal to seven. Or the set of all positives, x such that x is less than or equal to seven. Or the set of positives such that x is less than eight. Or, you know, you can play with natural numbers or things like that. Um, this one, most people found this was the set of 10 to the n, where n was bigger than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to 4. Although a number of people did the set of all 10 to the n plus 1, 
or the n minus 1, where n was bigger than or equal to 1 and less than or equal to 5. So there's, there's different ways to do this. This is the set of all 1 over n, where n is bigger than or equal to 1. And the 0, the set containing just a 0, and we talked about this a little last time, you could do the set of all x such that um, x is equal to 2 times x, or x is equal to negative x or x is bigger than or equal to zero and less than or equal to zero. Or, you know, you could always do the set of all x such that x equals zero, but that's, that's kind of a, a sort of tautological way to describe this set. Um, just like I could describe this as a set of all x where x is equal to 1, 10, 100,000, or 10,000. But it's not really, you know, a new way of describing this. Um, so, um, so that was the idea of, of that question. Um, all right, uh, one point two. Po we'll we'll talk about uh, Russell's paradox on Friday, maybe or another Friday. Uh, section one point two. So we're playing around with with operations on sets and such. So question four. Um, I asked you to find uh, specific sets to illustrate this. Um, and I think I said something like, um, what did I say? Show or describe exactly the contents of sets A, B, etc. So when I said show the contents of the set, I didn't mean draw a Venn diagram picture. What I meant was, you know, A equals curly bracket, one comma two comma three, close curly bracket. But probably about half the class took the word show, I think, to mean that they could draw a picture. And so I got a lot of Venn diagram um, demonstrations of this, um, which, you know, the first few I said something like, don't use Venn diagrams, but, but so many people did it. Um, but if you're going to use a Venn diagram to show something like this, you've got to put in enough detail so the person knows what you're seeing. Um, for example, if, if this first question, if A is a subset of B and B is a subset of C, then A is a subset of C, um, if what you do is is something like like this and that's your whole answer that doesn't really tell me what you're doing right so so you need to explain these things um, it's not as formal as a proof right a proof we'd have to do a membership table or use identities or something it says give examples to illustrate the following facts, but you still need to, to um, you know, describe what's going on if you're if you're using a Venn diagram to illustrate this. But the easiest way to to illustrate this is to pick specific sets. A equals one two, B equals one two three, C equals one two three four. And there's some sets where A is a subset of B, B is a subset of C, and guess what? A is a subset of C. All right. For B and C, it's harder to do these with a Venn diagram, right, without explanation. Um, but, you know, A take away B, B, B take away A, different things. Um, C, if you have two sets that are disjoint, meaning they have no intersection, and their union is the whole universe, then they're complements. And that's a nice fact to know. Um, and then D was a Cartesian product. D, I did not uh, grade. Um, but, you know, pick some sets, um, B and C and so on. So, so if I said you change the universe, right, on, on question four it says, let the universe be the integers from one through nine. And then, um, especially down in part C, people started um, uh, coming up with different universes. Um, Say again? I was just curious if anyone got 100% and what the mean or average is, whereas there's no like scales for anything in grading. And I was just curious if... Oh, yeah, there were, there were some hundreds. There were some, uh, there were some 20s, some 19s, uh, mostly 20s, 19s, 18s, um, a few lower ones. So, but I don't think Canvas does stats. I 
So that means pick A and B so that their union is the universe. So up here it says question four, let the universe be this. Give examples to illustrate the following. So you're picking sets A and B for each of these. So like if, if I have like A and B, then I would have had to like add, have like A and B a set containing one through like four and B being five through nine. Exactly, something. yeah. That, that's that's arguably a little bit ambiguous here because because I could see how one might interpret that to say take any sets a and B and let B be the universe so I don't know maybe that's not the best worded problem if... all right um all right, and then D, you take the intersection of B and C, and you cross-product that with A. And hopefully you picked sets A, B, and C so that this is a small uh, Cartesian product. Because the number of elements is going to be, you know, the product of the number of elements in each of those. Um, but I didn't grade that one. All right, um, part B, question six. So, um, so this one I looked at. So use an infinite universal set. It's good to have examples to to you know put specifics on some of these questions. So I'm going to think of a set of integers. That's kind of like my go-to universal infinite set. Um, and then A and B are subsets of them. So some infinite subsets. Um, part A says if A is an infinite subset, is the complement finite? In other words, if you start with an infinite number of things and you take away an infinite number of things, do you end up with a finite number of things? And intuitively, we might think yes, right? But um, but it's it's possible to find counterexamples. For example, if U is the universe of all integers and A is the universe of positive integers, the complement of A is still infinite. Or if A is odds, then the complement is evens. The complement is still infinite. So this is this is one of the counterintuitive things about infinite size. Um, you can take away an infinite amount of stuff and still have an infinite amount of stuff left over, which is kind of cool, right? Um, so part A, um, no, the complement does not need to be finite. Part B, does the union have to be infinite? Yes, it does. Because the union includes everything that's in A, and A is itself an infinite set. So the union will include an infinite set, which means, you know, that it's infinite. Does the intersection have to be infinite? No, absolutely not. Um, in particular, you know, if I take the set of integers and I intersect it with the set containing five, I get the set containing five. It's a very finite set. If I take the evens and I intersect with the odds, I get an empty set. If I take the positives and I intersect with the... the if I take the non-negatives and the non-positives and I intersect, I get a set containing zero. So no, the intersection does not have to be infinite. All right, and then um, 1.3, I looked at question two. So suppose you're about to flip a coin and roll a die. Um, a is head tail, B is one through six. What is uh, the magnitude or the, the cardinality of Cartesian product of A and B? Well, if A has two elements, B has six, we saw that the Cartesian product will have two times six, which is 12 elements. Um, and then it asks, how could you interpret the set A Cartesian product B? Um, and, and there's different ways to interpret this, but basically, you know, A cross B is a set of tuples where each tuple contains one of these followed by one of these. And so you could think of this as, you know, if you flip a coin and roll a die, A cross B shows you the set of all possible outcomes of doing those two things. You could get a head and a three, a head and six, a tail and five, a tail and one, right? There's 12 possibilities, and this Cartesian product basically lists all 12 of those possibilities. Question out of curiosity. Yeah. I did not grade number eight, um, but it looked like most people um, at least got off to the right start. Um, it's it's a lot of, of detail to grade. Um, 
but but I posted a video with what I think is a correct solution to it if you want to compare your work. Um, and this this is really just using that principle of inclusion exclusion. Um, and that video I posted is is about thirty minutes, but at the very end we go through this um, this particular problem. But it really builds up to it. And this problem I think is placed in the wrong spot in the book. It really should come after the chapter on counting because it uses this this principle of inclusion exclusion. But you can argue your way through this this question logically, and that's that's valuable. So that's why I left it in this set. Um, but decided not to grade it. So two people said 6,695. But I don't know which answer that is. Oh, for the last one. All right, so yeah. Um, so nice work on the homework. Any other questions on there? All right. If I took off a point for um, for changing the universe on a question, send me an email. I'll give you your point back. Because when I reread it right now, it seems like it's badly worded. Limited time offer, though. Got to do that today. Do you prefer an email through email or through Canvas? Email. Uh, through email, not through Canvas. Sequences and recurrence relations. So this is what we finished up with on uh, on Monday, and this is this is really a cornerstone to this course. Um, it's a topic like many that we'll come back to again and again. But I wanted to to make a few more comments on it. Um, yeah, that was a cool spreadsheet. <laughs> I wanted to make a few comments on. Um, this idea of a recurrence relation. So remember, a sequence is is just um, it's just a ordered set collection of of things. It you know could have repeats. It might not have an apparent pattern. But it's it's ordered. That's the distinction from a set, um, and and we can you know write an expression for um, each term as you know say a subscripted variable, so a zero, a one, a two, and so on, um, and and it gets interesting when um, we have a rule for describing these terms of the sequence. And it may be that we have some rule which says, you know, a n equals, you know, some function of a 1, a 2, up through a n minus 1. Right, there may be some way to describe what the next term of the sequence is based on all the prior terms. And when we do this, we usually need to have some sort of initial condition which says explicitly what in this case say a1 is equal to. And then this would give us the, the nth term for any n bigger than one. And so this is called a recurrence relation. And they don't always exist, but sometimes they do. So we looked at a few examples of this. So let me give you kind of the quintessential 
recurrence relation. Right, so here's a sequence where the first two terms are a 1, and the third term on can be written as the sum of the two prior terms. So if we write the elements of this sequence, the first term is a 1, the second term is a 1. The third term, a3, should be the sum of a2 and a1. Sorry, a2 should be the sum of a1 and a0. That's 1 plus 1 is a 2. A3 should be the sum of A2 and A1, that's 2 plus 1 is 3. A4 we can now find is the sum of A3 and A2, that's 3 plus 2 is 5, and so on. And so you can write this out. And so what's this sequence called? And if you watch a lot of YouTube, you've definitely come across this. That's a Fibonacci sequence. And it's a really famous sequence. Um, and it pops up in so many places. It pops up in the natural world. It pops up in, in human-made systems. It pops up in music. Um, and, and it will pop up in this course multiple times. But that's, that's a nice sequence to, to know and to work with and to illustrate very, very definitely this idea of a recurrence relation. And it's not clear without this formula that we could write an expression for a n that wasn't using this kind of recurrence relation. In other words, a n equals, you know, n squared plus 17 or something like that. It turns out there is a way to do that, but it's not what you would expect. Um, but this, you know, is most easily defined by describing the nth term as a function of, of the prior n minus 1 terms. And we'll see that a lot. And it turns out a lot of functions that we could normally write, you know, in some other way, um, we can write with a recurrence relation. For example, um, a0 equals 0, a n equals a n minus 1 plus 5 for n bigger than or equal to 1. Well, what does this look like? It starts off with the term 0. a1 will be a0 plus 5 is just 5. A2 will be A1 plus 5, while A1 is 5, so this is 10. Right, and this is just counting by 5s. And we can define powers of 2, factorials, triangle numbers, squares, all kinds of things using this recurrence relation idea. All right, um, matrices. So we, we touch on matrices in CSE 120 when we're doing those dreaded three-letter words, KVL and KCL. Um, and some people here are in linear, so you're doing matrices in your sleep, right? Um, and And... We encounter these in different places, um, so I'm not going to spend more than like five minutes going over matrices, but you know, what is a matrix? Well, it's big parentheses with a bunch of things, you know, written in columns. There's my fancy definition of a matrix. Um, and if we have two matrices with the same size, and they don't have to be three by three, it could be, you know, 15 by four or something like that. But if you have two matrices of the same size, we can define addition by just adding together the things from, you know, the upper left corner of here, adds to the upper left corner of here, gives the upper left corner of that. The first row, second column here, plus the first row, second column there, gives the first row, second column there, and so on. So we can, we can define addition of matrices pretty easily. And we can also define, you know, a constant times a matrix 
and it's it makes sense to just define that as multiplying each term times that constant. Um, yeah, this is also the same as, as the ones in brackets. I don't know why I'm doing parentheses today. They should be in brackets. What's interesting with matrices is if you have two matrices A and B, we can define multiplication on them. But in general, it's not commutative. And that's different. Because we're so used to multiplication not caring about the order. But with matrices, the order definitely makes a difference. So that's one interesting mm -hmm. thing. Second interesting thing is we don't have a division operator. We don't have a formal way to say A over B. But sometimes we have a way for a matrix B to define an inverse. Not always. But sometimes we can define an inverse. What does an inverse mean? It means if you take B and you multiply by its inverse, you get something like the number one, something called the identity matrix. Identity matrix is just ones going down the diagonal with zeros everywhere else. And if we have a B inverse, what we can do is we can define A times B inverse. And that looks an awful lot like A divided by B. But it's technically not division. Isn't the, the, the identity matrix looks like it's um, like an, an echelon matrix? Mm-hmm. Yeah, echelon. Um, yeah, so so um, identity matrix is is a particular version of that. It's got zeros everywhere except right along the diagonal from upper left to lower right. And it's the identity because if you take any matrix and multiply by this, you get back your original matrix. And that's commutative. And the reason AB doesn't equal BA comes into the way that we define addition be, or multiplication because multiplication is not just this times this, that times that, that times that. Multiplication to find the element up here, we take the first row over here, the first column over here, and we do their dot product, which means take the product of those terms, product of those, product of those, add them up. That gives us our first term here. And if you work that through with pretty much any example, you're going to find that the order in which you do these makes a difference. Because if I swap these around, this first element is going to be the product of this row and this column. And matrices get into their own, you know, mathematics really quickly, which is why there's a whole separate course, Math 215. Um, and matrices, you know, kind of make the world go round. Um, and in particular, being able to find the inverse of a matrix is like the key to fame and fortune. Because um, it lets you solve systems of equations quickly. So computer scientists spend a lot of time trying to figure out fast ways to invert matrices. I don't know if a matrix would have helped with question eight. Um, but there's a lot of questions that are really complex to solve kind of the barehanded way, but if you can put them in the language of matrices, they end up being simpler in some sense. And simultaneous equations is, is the classic example of that. You have 15 equations with 15 unknowns. How do you find the values of those, those unknowns to satisfy all equations? Well, you know, you can do simplification and substitution and, and elimination of variables and so on, but it's really one matrix equation you have to solve. Um, and so sometimes it would help us simplify things. I'm not sure how I would apply it to question H. The donut rendering code that is in the shape of a donut uses matrices. Oh, cool. Um, 
Yeah, matrices will pop up in all kinds of, of computer work, um, especially in uh, graphics and um, robotics and things like that. And occasionally you use them in real life. I've actually used one like a year ago. I was shocked. But um, use it for one of my Minecraft videos. All right, um, so so that's all I'm going to say about matrices, right? You you encounter these elsewhere, but just be aware of them, and and they're interesting because of the non-commutivity and the lack of inverses. I'm not going to ask you to do matrix operations on a test or something like that, though. Um, but I want to mention them anyway. All right, so on to propositional logic. Um, so this is, I believe, chapter three in the text. Um, and this is, this is um, going to take us a few weeks to go over. We're going to introduce some terminology and some basic ideas. Um, and this will be built around the idea of a proposition. And a lot of what we do in this subject area is we create new propositions from old ones, just like we create new sets from old sets or we create new equations from old equations in a math course, right? So here we're going to learn about propositions and ways that we can create new propositions from old. And then we're going to, um, to apply what we learn about propositions to um, analyzing and answering questions in logic. All right, that's an interesting link that was just posted in uh, in the chat window. That's pretty cool. There's so much cool stuff in the world. All right, so let's let's start with some uh, some definitions. And this first definition is going to be vitally important. Um, and we're going to come back to it again and again throughout this subject. And sometimes you'll get notes back on homework, and I'll say something like, this is not a proposition. So um, a proposition... is a declarative statement that has a truth value. Okay, that's our most basic definition. And you're really going to want to internalize this. When we get to writing proofs, every line of our proof is going to have to be a proposition. And as you write your proof and after you're done and you review it, you want to go through and you want to ask, is this line of my proof a declarative statement with a truth value? How about this line? How about this line? If you do that and you catch yourself when, you, when, when the answer is no, you'll save yourself a lot of lost points. Because inevitably, by, by halfway through the course, a lot of people are turning in proofs um, and other demonstrations, and they're not writing propositions. All right, so um, are the following things propositions? So the following things are propositions. My name is Nick. It's a declarative statement, and it has a truth value. 1 plus 1 equals 5. That is a proposition. It's a declarative statement. I'm stating 1 plus 1 is equal to 5. And it has a truth value. The truth value happens to be false. But it's still a proposition, even though it's false. n plus 1 is not a proposition. It's not declaring anything. It's an arithmetic operation.
this is a proposition. I'm saying this is equal to that. Why does it rain? That's not a proposition. It's a good question. But it's not a declaration. All right, you got the idea? It's it's not a startling concept, right? But it's it's really fundamental. All right, so um, a propositional variable. is just typically a letter or a variable which is used to represent a proposition all right there is, is an acceptable way to define the value of a propositional variable. Let P be the proposition. Uh, 1 plus 1 equals 5. Okay. That's a perfectly valid way to describe a propositional variable's value. Let P be the proposition 1 plus 1 equals 5. I'm going to ask you to take the extra time to spell things out like this. When you're doing a proof and you need a proposition P that means something, I want you to write out in words. Let P be the proposition and then state the proposition. do this. This is guaranteed instant loss of points. Because you've just written something that is that is confusing and not true. You said let p equal 2 which is equal to 5. And that makes no sense. How can I have P be equal to 2 and also be equal to 5? Right? And it's because you're using the equal sign to mean let P be the proposition that 1 plus 1 equals 5. But we're going to do a lot of propositions that involve arithmetic expressions, algebraic expressions, and therefore involve equal signs. So using this equal sign over here in part of an English sentence is going to get you into all kinds of trouble. So do not do that, right? Let P be the proposition. 1 plus 1 equals 5. That's a good way to do it. And this is not just being kind of OCD-ish about this, right? If you write things like this, you will get into trouble on proofs. It will steer your proof in a different direction. Now, you're probably not going to write let p equal 1 plus 1 equals 5, but you'll start writing things like let p equal n plus 1 equals such and such, right? And, and I guarantee it will, get you, it will get you down a bad path. So when we define propositions, write out let p be the proposition such and such. All right, because propositions have truth values, right, 
we can say something like, you know, P is true or P is false. We can analyze the truth value of any proposition. And true, you know, we usually write as T, false we usually write as F. But sometimes we do a one, sometimes we do a zero. This is ambiguous. One does not always mean true, zero does not always mean false. In particular, when you're doing engineering, if you're working with what's called negative logic, zero is true and one is false. Why? Why not? I mean, it's arbitrary, right? But we'll stick with T and F in most cases because T, you know, stands for true. Cookie Monster would approve. F stands for false. Um, but these are really just symbols, and, and there's, there's almost nowhere that we're going to encounter a fundamental difference between true and false, right? Where they're really different in any significant way other than what we happen to call them. But we'll mostly stick with true and false. All right, so this lets us define um, propositional calculus. So what is calculus? Where does the term calculus come from? Calculation, right? It, it comes from an every, a very old word for stone um, because stones were used for reckoning, for, for counting and, and tallying. Um, and it's, it's really about calculation. So propositional calculus is about, you know, doing reckoning with propositions, doing calculations in some sense with, with propositions. And as I said a little while ago, a lot of what we do is we take propositions and we use them to build new propositions. And so I want to look at things we can do to propositions that lead us to new ones. Um, and how old is propositional calculus, do you think? Where did this really come from? Scientific, scientific method? Mm-hmm. That's definitely part of it, yeah, because this ties into, like, logical reasoning. What else? Mm-hmm. So how old, how old do you think this is? Yeah, I don't know if it's 3,500, but it's definitely a few thousand years old. Um, you can trace this back at least as far as Aristotle. So, you know, circa 300 BC. So this, this is not uh, new stuff. Now, it's, it's the foundation of computer science. It's the foundation for the von Neumann architecture which is, you know, fairly new. Um, and the work of George Boole in the mid-1800s laid the foundation for Boolean um, circuitry, right? He basically developed Boolean algebra. Um, but go back a couple of thousand years before that to really get to the, the roots of, of this idea of the study of logical reasoning. Um, so someone says in chat, I've seen an arrow notation in math. Yeah, we will be using a few different arrow notations in here. There's going to be a lot of symbology in, uh, in this, this part of the course. Um, in fact, we'll hit some of it right away. Um, all right, so new propositions from old. So um, throughout all of this, um, I'm going to make some, some general... Uh, comments. So let P, Q, and R be propositions. So I don't want to keep writing that. So P, Q, and R I'm just going to use as propositional variables. <clears throat> I'm not necessarily saying what the values of those variables are. Just imagine that they're propositions. Well, if P is a proposition, 
we can write a new proposition which looks like this. It's this, this horizontal bar with a little hook on the end, followed by the name of the proposition. And this is called the negation of P. It's also sometimes called not P. So we had a proposition, my name is Nick. The negation of that is um, not my name is Nick. Right? Or if we were, you know, speaking as humans, my name is not Nick. The negation of this would be 1 plus 1 is not equal to 5. The negation of this would be n plus 1 squared is not equal to n squared plus 2n plus 1. And you can see n plus 1, the negation of that, doesn't make any sense. What does it mean to say not n plus 1? What does it mean to say not why does it rain? Well, part of the reason that those don't make sense is because these are not propositions. But if you have a proposition, a declarative statement, you can make a new proposition, which is basically the negation of that. So declarative statement, today is Wednesday. The negation would be today is not Wednesday. It's raining or it's not raining. And we can... We can define what this negation operation does to the value of a proposition by writing a truth table. Now since every proposition has a truth value, a proposition is either false or true. And if a proposition is false, then the negation is guaranteed to be true. And if a proposition is true, the negation is guaranteed to be false. So if P is the proposition that my name is Nick, that's got a truth value of true. The proposition that my name is not Nick is going to have a value of false. And I don't know what the history of this notation is, but the bar on top is, is something we find more when we're dealing with, with Boolean algebra. Um, and the the line with the hook is, I think, just a much older notation. Um, but it also, I think if you do PL1, it pops up in there, too. But you can think of it as being just a bar on top. Now, I always want you to use this when we're doing propositional logic. We want to stick to this notation. All right. Well, if we've got propositions P and Q. Um, we can also define P with a caret followed by Q, and this is called the conjunction of P and Q. And we can define what conjunction does because there's only four possibilities for the combined truth values of P and Q. And conjunction is basically an AND. So let's say uh, P is the proposition uh, 1 plus 1 equals 5. Q is the proposition um, My name is Nick. So P and Q is the proposition 1 plus 1 equals 5 and my name is Nick. Well, if P and Q are false, then P and Q is definitely false. If P is false, then P and Q is false because they're not both true. And if Q is false, same thing. But in the one case where P is true and Q is true, then this conjunction P and Q will also turn out to be true. And so that's a good old AND gate. P or Q, this is the disjunction. 
which looks like an ore. And its truth table looks exactly like an ore from 250. So one plus one equals five, or my name is Nick. That new proposition is true. It's true because the second part happened to be true. Right, so that's true, true, true. But if both P and Q are false, then P or Q is also false. And not very often, we'll talk about an exclusive or. Which is that, you know, 250 symbol, the or sign with the circle around it. And the exclusive or looks just like disjunction, except if both P and Q are true, then the XOR is false. This doesn't pop up a lot in this forum because we have a better way to describe this. And so we have, you know, another rendering of, of Engineering 250, um, another rendering of, of set operations. This time it's in the, the framework of propositions and combining propositions. But, you know, we can start rattling off a bunch of theorems from what we know from Engineering 250. Um, for example, um, the negation of P and Q is going to be the negation of P or with the negation of Q. De Morgan's theorem is going to work. And you can see that you get all those things for free because this is basically the truth table for an or, this is an and, this is a not. So any statement we already know about relationships among those operations will work over here just like it worked in set theory. All right, good so far. That's all kind of preamble. It's, it's stuff that, that, you know, we've encountered before. And so we're just sort of changing the labels. So now we're ready to, to go on to some newer stuff. So starting with conditional statements. So here's our first use of an arrow in this course. Um, and again, P, Q, and R are propositions, right? So P arrow R is the proposition. If P, then Q. R, I guess we're going with. If P, then R. So when we write P arrow R, that's a proposition, that's a proposition. This whole thing is a third proposition, which says if P, then R. And when we have a proposition like this, if something, then something else, we call this P the hypothesis. And we call the R the conclusion. And sometimes we just call these things if statements, right? And there's, there's a lot of different language around this subject. And when we talk about propositional logic, we have to be a little careful with language because a lot of these concepts are things that we deal with in daily life. They're things that we've learned throughout life. And suddenly we're putting really precise meanings on them. For example, when you go to um, a restaurant, Remember when we used to go to restaurants? And, and you're asked, would you like soup or salad? Right? We understand that that or is an exclusive or. That we're being asked to select soup or salad, but not both. Right? But, but technically, you know, 
soup or salad, you could say yes to both, and and that proposition would be true, right? And technically, the correct analysis of soup or salad is not soup and it's not salad, it's true or false. It's true if you want a soup or a salad or both, and it's false if you want neither, right? Now, this is not how we conduct ourselves in restaurants, but in, in CSE 215, this is, this is a different um, construct, right? Um, and so we've, we've got to sometimes forget what we are used to doing with things like, you know, if and or and 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 so on and come back to this very sort of rigorous um, notion. All right, so let me show you some of the language around this conditional statement. Um, one way to interpret this is if P, then R. And that's, that's always a correct way to look at this. That's literally, you know, what I see when I, when I look at P arrow R. Um, but there's other ways we'll see this expressed. For example, if P comma R. If it's sunny, comma, I'm going to go for a run. That means the same thing to us as if it's sunny, then I'm going to go for a run. And it sounds a little less hoity-toity to just say if P R. P is sufficient for R. Well, that's a little weird sounding. It is sunny is sufficient for I am going to go for a run. In other words, this is all that needs to be true for that to be true. It basically means the same thing. It means if this is true, then that is true. So if P is true, R is also true, like normal arrow notation, right? So, so if P, then R. R if P. I am going for a run if it is sunny. That's not too bad. R unless the negation of P. I am going for a run unless not it is sunny. I'm going for a run unless it's not sunny. R follows from P. Let me show you one that's going to look really weird. P only if R. Now, logically, this means exactly the same thing as this, if P, then R. Because what this means is, is if R is not true, then P cannot be true. A similar statement is a necessary condition for P is R. The prop... Go ahead. That's right. And here's where that gets weird because to us that implies causality. That makes it sound like if I go for a run, it's going to get sunny out, right? These are not temporal cause and effect kind of statements, though, right? This is saying, if it's sunny, then I'm going to go for a run. It's sunny only if I'm going to go for a run. 
That's a true statement. Doesn't mean that if I decide to go for a run, the sun's going to come out. It means if I go for a run, it's got to be sunny out. Because if I go for a, if it's sunny, I go for a run. If I don't go for a run, it can't be sunny out. Because if it's sunny, I am going to go for a run. So if I don't go for a run, you know it can't be sunny. So it can be sunny only if I go for a run. And that that takes some digestion to get down. Um, because like I say, to me that sounds like causality, right? But But it's not. And, and it's, let P be the proposition, N equals 5. Let Q be the proposition, N squared equals 25. Well, we agree that if P, then Q is a true statement, right? If N equals 5, then N squared equals 25. That's absolutely true. Well, this statement here says n equals 5 only if n squared equals 25. And that doesn't seem very controversial, right? n equals 5 only if n squared equals 25. Well, that's absolutely true. Because if n squared is not 25, there's no way n can be 5. Because if n is 5, we know n squared is going to be 25. All right, it gets worse. If P, then R. Suppose P is true and R is also true. Is it true in this case that if P is true, then R is true? Well, yeah, it is. Right? This says if P is true, then R is true. Well, in this particular case, right, if we picked some variables where P was true and R was true, it turns out, you know, P is true and R is also true. So yeah, this statement is absolutely true in that case. If P is true, then R is true. So this is true. It's as easy to see that in this third row, suppose P is true and R is false. Is this statement, if P, then R, true or false? It's totally false, because this is saying if P is true, R is true. But in this particular case, P was true and R was false. So this is absolutely false. And let, let me put some, some sample propositions on here. Let P be the proposition um, N is bigger than 10. Let R be the proposition N is bigger than 5. So this is the proposition if n is bigger than 10 then n is bigger than 5 
Is this a true proposition? If n is bigger than 10, is n bigger than 5? Is there any case where that's not true? Well, we're just working with integers here. So no funny numbers. So I got one believer. There's no trick here. If n is bigger than 10, is n bigger than 5? Yeah, absolutely. Right? As long as we're working on integers and, and nothing weird has happened to the universe, which is not a safe assumption anymore. But, you know, as long as we're working with integers, if some number is bigger than 10, it's bigger than 5. Right? Okay, so with this as an example proposition... Um, Suppose n is equal to 0. Okay, is the proposition p true or false? Is n bigger than 10? That's false. Is the proposition r true or false? Is n bigger than 5? It's also false. So n equals 0 is an example of this first row of our truth table. p is false and r is false. But if P then R, we already decided, is true. So this first row of the truth table is actually true. And if I pick a value of N like 7, well, P says N is bigger than 10. That's false. R says N is bigger than 5. That's true. So N equals 7 would be an example where this second row of the truth table describes the values of P and R, false and true. But we've already said if P then R is always true. And this fourth row would be an example of, say, N equals 2,000, right? Well, P is true because N is bigger than 10, and R is true because N is bigger than 5. Right? And in that case, if P then R is true, because if P then R is always true. This third row of the table where if P then R is false never occurs. If we had a P that was true and an R that was false, then this implication, this conditional statement would be false. But guess what? For every value of N that we can find, we're never in this third row. And that's really just a restatement of the fact that if P then R is always true, which means any value of N that we come up with is going to be a value that corresponds to either the first, the second, or the fourth row of this truth table. So that's working with a particular pair of propositions, P and R, and arguing logically through, you know, the truth value of this conditional. But it turns out this is the truth table for a conditional statement, regardless of the values of P and R. And this fourth row causes us no problem. This third row causes us no problem. These first two rows usually take a bit of, of uh, head-scratching to come to terms with. So this first row says, you know, if P is false, then if P then R is true. And, and that, you know, maybe we can make some sense out of that. I mean, it certainly works here. If N is bigger than 10, then N is bigger than 5. Well, if N is smaller than 10, right, and it's smaller than 5, that doesn't tell us, you know, that this, this if statement fails to be true. But let's, let's look at some other examples of propositions related to this. Let P be the proposition 
I won the lottery. Let Q be the proposition. Uh, I quit my job. I wouldn't actually quit my job if I won the lottery. All right, so right now, P is false, and right now, Q is false, right? But this conditional statement says, if I won the lottery, then I quit my job. Well, you can't claim that that propositional statement is false, right? Simply because I didn't win the lottery and I didn't quit my job, right? This doesn't claim anything about what happens if I don't win the lottery. All that this says is, if I win the lottery, I quit my job. Well, if I didn't win the lottery, this statement doesn't make any claims at all. So this is still true. And so we can get into interesting things like this. If 1 plus 1 equals 3, then time travel is possible. And guess what? According to the rules of propositional logic, this is a true statement. If 1 plus 1 equals 3, then time travel is possible. Well, 1 plus 1 equals 3 has a false value. Time travel is possible. I don't know whether that's false or true, but either way, the conditional statement is true. And this is sometimes written as if false than anything. Be a good t-shirt. Right? The reason this conditional statement is true is because the hypothesis is guaranteed to be false. So if 1 plus 1 equals 3, I'm also the Queen of England. And we use this sometimes colloquially, right? Um, you know, if Tesla sells any of those crazy electric cars, then I'm a monkey's uncle, right? And you say that to illustrate the absurdity of the hypothesis by saying if this was true, something ridiculous would happen, right? And when you say that, you're, you're saying it with great certainty that what you've just said is a true statement. And it's true provided the hypothesis is always false. Right? So we kind of understand this in some ways at an intuitive level. If something ridiculous, then whatever you want to conclude. All right? So, so I'm not asking you to, to um, swallow this completely. I'm not suggesting that, you know, with a little bit of hand-waving, you should now be convinced that all of this makes perfect sense and there's nothing weird about it, okay? Um, it actually took me a few years of teaching this before I started to feel like there wasn't something slightly shady going on, and I'm pretty comfortable with this now. But it's a weird concept, but it's a really good illustration of, of how our intuition will sometimes fail us in this part of the course, right? actually in a lot of parts of the course. Um, your intuition is, is useful as a guide, right? And if it will lead us to, to a valid proof, that's good. But we're always going to need to come back to something very rigorous in order to actually demonstrate that something is a certain way. And so that's, that's the point of this, this unit on, on uh, propositional logic is to, you know, explore and develop and get some practice with that rigor. And this, you know, ultimately comes back to what we do in programming, right? You're supposed to write a program to do something while you put down some code and you're pretty sure that works. How do you know it works? How do you know that this algorithm you came up with always sorts your numbers? 
Or how do you know that it always starts it with a certain efficiency? Or how do you know that this particular set of inputs um, will always do this particular action? Right? So we always want this stuff spinning underneath. Um, and, and the more we can have it working at kind of a, a low grade level, um, the more we can, you know, concentrate on other things. All right. Um, so let's see. We've got 53 seconds left. Um, all right. I am going to post some homework questions on, no, I'm not. I'll just skip homework. Um, we'll, we'll post some homework questions on Friday and we'll make them do next week. Um, all right. So we'll continue this on Friday and remember Monday is a day off. So no class on Monday. Um, but we will meet on Friday. We'll continue uh, looking at truth tables for some of these other operations on propositions and then start building up from there. All right, I am going for a run even though it's not quite as sunny anymore. Um, have a good afternoon. I will see you next time.